friend. So dear. And giving my sad heart for holding my hand when I could not stand. Thank you, Lord, for giving your life for me on a cross at Calvary, taking my place, mercy and grace. Thank
Breathe. 
were getting concerned Oh, the wind started violently blowing But he was asleep in the stern Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid Oh, but Jesus arose when they called him he said to them, where is your faith? Because you prayed all night. Because you failed on with all your mind. Child, your cries have opened the master. Oh, he knows your voice. Lift your head. To rejoice, child, your cries have opened the master. Well, it hit you without any warning. That storm of your life had begun. But seeing no hope in the distance. You're frightened and nowhere to run. Oh, by now your vessel is filling and you're thinking that you'll surely drown. You've cried out for help from the Savior and you know you can't give up now because you prayed all night. 
Because you held on with all of your mind Child, your cries had awoken the Master Child, your cries have awoken the master. Oh, you're up there worried that he's fast asleep. The winds are so deadly, the water's so deep. But try to be patient, for soon he'll bring peace. Just one word from his voice, and it all must see. Child, your cries have awoken, Master. Because you prayed all night, cause you've held on with all of your might, child, your cries have awoken the Master. I guess I'd ask this question. I wonder if anybody's ever really had to pray all night. Uh, I wonder if there's ever been anybody that's ever maybe slept, woke up a little bit, prayed a little more, slept, woke up, prayed a little more. If you ever got to that place to where you, you really just kind of keep bouncing back and forth, you know, and it ain't always about difficulties. It's not always about trials. Sometimes it's about stress. Sometimes you get overwhelmed, you're going through things, you're dealing with things. Sometimes it's the worry of tomorrow. Though know, truth be told, that song, I've always loved that song because it, it matters to me to know that I have a Heavenly Father that's attentive to my prayer. Uh, and you might not want to admit this, but there's a lot of times that people don't like to hear us ramble. They don't like to hear us vent. They don't like to hear us complain. I'm glad I got a Heavenly Father that he tolerates and he's patient with me. And when I want to complain and I want to vent, I can talk to him because he's my heavenly father. Now, he might not necessarily condone all of my actions, my feelings, but he'll listen to me. But you know, I've learned too that with that song, it says, I've held on as long as you can. You know, it amazes me because all through the scriptures, there's a lot of times where I see the false perception that we think that we hold on. And I know that there's songs like that that says that we hold on. Yeah. And I do understand the concept of it. But you know, the Bible don't contradict itself. It's not going to say one thing and mean another. It's not going to lie. But you know, the principle is this. Is there's a deep principle that you see inside of it that says, you know, when you look back, you realize that when you held on, you held on as long as you can. But at the end of the day, even when you let go, it wasn't you holding on to Him. It was Him holding on to you. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes we have to come to that reality. 
we have to come to that moment where your fingers really get to where they're weary to where you're almost losing your grip and you begin to break out and forgive me for being just real about this but break out in a sweat because you you know the moment of breaking is is right there and again i want to say this you be the most spiritual sold out king james down the line know your bible front to back been saved for fifty thousand years and if you're praying for somebody there's moments where your faith will get thin i don't care how religious you think you are because God will always let you go through something. And if you've got it so figured out, and if you are so structured, and you are so disciplined yourself, there's somebody else that he'll use in your life to help you draw you to himself. God will do whatever it is, because God wants complete dependency upon him. Amen. And she sings this song, The Anchor Holds. You know, I don't know if there's a greater truth. Somebody said, well, I don't like the, the person who wrote it. No, I don't like the person who wrote a lot of songs. I could care less. I'm not, I'm not thinking about the person who wrote it. I'm thinking about the Savior they're talking about. Amen. Amen. It matters to me to know that when the, the winds blow and when life is crazy and chaotic, that I don't have to trust in what I see. I can trust in what I know. And what I know is in the knowledge that's been taught to me, it's been a faith that's been given to me, and it was given to me by God. And what God gives, God don't take away. Amen, that's deep, but it's shallow at the same time, trust me. Because your education, you'll doubt it sometimes. And what you know in your experience, you will doubt it sometimes. But what God births in your heart, there ain't nobody that can ever take it away. You believe that, say amen. amen. You mind the Lord as they sing. Let it, let it minister to you if it helps you. If you need to come, you come. My God.
This is a new day that you've given us and we need to be, Lord, sensitive, Lord, to what you want to do. And Father, I'm thankful that God, that you're able to remind us, that God, that you, you are a present help in the time of need, that you are true to your word, and Lord, even as the Bible says, that to honor you, Lord, the way we should, and to honor your word, because God, you're not a liar. You don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I pray that you would take the few moments that we have. And Lord, that you would allow me to speak the words that you would have me to speak. And God, that you would help me, Lord, to be, Lord, a vessel that's usable this morning. Lord, to have clarity for people to receive your word, to where God that would draw us closer because Lord ultimately our our desire is Lord to be more Christ like and we know that God the closer we get to you the more that we have to walk after the spirit and not the flesh and Lord we want to shake off the things of this world we don't 
want the things holding us down that used to hold us down. But Father, we want to do whatever we need to do to be able to get close to you. Father, I pray that you captivate our minds. Lord, that you would, Lord, even arrest my mind. And God, to where I could only hear, Lord, the voice of God as I would be your messenger this morning. Thank you for those that's come around this altar. Thank you for a church where there's liberty to get around an altar. God, we're so blessed. And I want you to know I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to look in Psalms chapter number 105, and I want to, uh, I want to touch a few verses here. And I want to be able to go backwards if I could, to be able to go back to the book of Genesis. But I want to bring something to your attention. A couple weeks ago, uh, we were at teen camp, and uh, we had one of the gentlemen, one of the preachers that actually preached uh, on Joseph. And when he was preaching on Joseph, uh, he had talked a lot about uh, the different things, about what Joseph had went through. And, and something had, had struck out uh, in my attention after looking and reading some things, and I trust that this morning that it may be a help to you. But I want you to look, and we're going to start reading in verse number 16. We're going to read through verse number 24. The Bible says this, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He brake the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent him, sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure. And to teach his senators wisdom. Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. You may look this way for a moment. If I was to give a title to this this morning, if there was going to be a a certain specific thing, I think it's more of a principle that's underlining. To be able to understand that the life that Joseph lived is very similar to the life that Jesus lived. For a lot of preachers, a lot of Bible scholars and different people always say that there's nobody closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as an example than the very man Joseph himself. And when you begin to look at that, you see a lot of things that are very similar. But it truth be told, when you begin to break down the walls of Joseph's life and you begin to look at all the different things, you see here in this book, in the book of Psalms, in chapter 105, where the psalmist begin to unload some things. And if you read the entire chapter, you would see some things that are in this chapter where uh, he ain't necessarily talking about negative. He's not talking about the doom and the gloom. He's not talking about bad. He, he's, he's actually rejoicing. He's actually talking about the good things. He's speaking about the covenant with Abraham. He's talking about the things that went on uh, there with Joseph. He's also talking about the people of God. And, and really, he breaks out in praise. It's almost like a worship. And when you begin to read all the way through chapter 105, you see that it's almost this dynamic chapter that begins to unload different things that talk about the goodness of God and the power of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. So really, he's looking back and he's reflecting and he's taking a time out as the song that we sing, Do You Remember? You can look back when God first saved you. You can look back when God rescued you. You can look back where God helped you. And all of us this morning would have to agree that sometimes the the best moments in our life is when we look back and we realize what God's already done for us. I would dare say that a lot of us probably forget what God's done for us more than we realize what God has done for us. You believe that? Say amen. God has really been good to us. Even while we were yet sinners, He was good to us because He loved us enough to be able to give His Son to die on the cross. Even when we were separated from God, God sent His Son for us. God's been good. So when you look at this, you begin to see all the glamour and all the hype in chapter number 105, and you see the goodness. But the problem is, is when you get to verse number 16 through verse number 24, you see something begin to change, and where it begins to lay out this this order of praise and worship and gratitude and appreciation and the power of God and, and, and the majesty of God and how wonderful God is. You get to verse number 16, and it's almost like the the, the jaws of Satan, the jaws of life, literally the vice, if you will, grips down on Joseph. And in the middle of everything being great for everybody, this man by the name of Joseph, the Bible says he suffered. Now when you look at that, it stands out like a sore thumb to me. 
And the reason is because when I begin to see all the other things that happen, I wonder why in the world would there be such a negative thing brought in the middle of a positive chapter? Why in the world would God make a point for us to be able to see that? Why in the world would the Lord put such a, a significance on something that seems to be so insignificant? Why would God do something like that? And I thought in my mind that literally he's describing the life that Joseph lived which is really a nightmare. I want you to think about a lot of things, and let me define what nightmare would be. A nightmare, just by definition, is a terrifying or unpleasant experience. It's stated to be a situation difficult to be able to deal with, a frightening dream. I mean, I'm talking about a nightmare is something that is very hard to deal with. If you ever had nightmares in the middle of the night, you almost want to wake yourself up because you don't want to stay in that moment because it's terrifying, it's hurtful, it's scary, and you don't know what tomorrow brings you. You don't know what's true, you don't know what's a lie, and you're finding yourself being in the middle of a battle because you don't know what to do to find out that literally you have no control on what's going on. But the Bible, the Bible says that he was in a place to where he was in a terrifying moment that he was literally bound, if you will. By definition, dream means this, a series of thoughts or imaginations. A state of mind when someone seems to be unaware of surroundings, an unreal, uh, unrealistic fantasy. Let me say that again. A dream is a series of thoughts of imaginations. A state of mind when someone seems to be unaware of surroundings. A nightmare is a terrifying or unpleasant experience, a situation Difficult to deal with. I wonder this morning if you could think for a second, a child, a situation, a home, a marriage, a problem where it seems to be a nightmare. Maybe it's a medical issue that you've been dealing with for a long time. Or maybe it's a sin issue that you've been dealing with for a long time. And it's like a nightmare. You can't wake up out of it. You can't get past it. You can't get your children through it. You can't get rid of the scars or the wounds or the hurt. You can't get rid of the frustration. And it seems to be a nightmare. It's settled in to where it's terrifying you because now what is a fantasy seems to be coming to life because every single day you face it, every single week you face it, every single month you face it. You can't get past it. You can't get over it. You can't get under it. And you're finding yourself beginning to crumble down deep on the inside and you just don't know what to do the Bible says that Joseph was in this place to where literally that he is now shackled down the Bible says that his feet are put in fetters that he is put down in a device that has gripped him to where he can't get past where he is and when you study the book of Genesis from chapter number 37 all the way through chapter number 50 you, be you begin to see how Joseph lived his life how he was a good man how he loved God how he served God how he stood for God how he humbled himself for God but even in spite of the way he stood and even the way, in spite of the way he humbled himself and even in spite of the way that he stood up for God and lived right and tried right and spoke right and reacted right in spite of that it was like he stayed in the middle of a nightmare and in Psalms 105 in the middle of this glorious chapter about eight or nine verses is taken out to talk about something it is so hard to live with, with the path that this man by the name of Joseph had to walk. I want you to listen to what the Bible says about our path. The Bible says in Job 33, 11, He putteth my feet in the stocks, he marketh all my paths. Psalms 18, 33, and 2 Samuel twenty two thirty four 34 say the same thing. He maketh my feet little hind's feet, like hind's feet. He, he sitteth, upon, sitteth my upon the high places. 
Psalms 37, 24, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by our Lord. I mean, in your mind, you're thinking God owns me. He, he controls me. He directs me. And when you begin to think about the turmoil and the struggles and the pain and the nightmare that you live, when you know that God is in control of you, you begin to wonder, God, if you're in control, are you controlling me to walk the path I'm walking? Are you controlling me to live the life I'm living? Are you controlling me to think the way I'm thinking, God? It seems like a nightmare. The Bible says in Psalms chapter number 17, verse number 5, hold up my goings in the past that my foot slip, my footsteps slip not. God, you're in control of me. I don't want to slip. I don't want to, I don't want to mess up. I don't want to fall. I, I don't want to get out of place. I don't, I don't want to get out of whack. God, I'm, 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 I'm at your mercy, Lord. You, you got to control me where I don't slip. He says in Psalms 94, 18, when I said my foot slippeth, they, thy mercy, O Lord, it held me up. How many of you are thankful that God still holds you up? Amen. Psalms 121, 3, when when the psalmist began to find him way as he was trying to figure out how he was going to ascend up the mountain. As you study through all of those psalms and those chapters, the Bible says that he, he looks for his help. He says, from whence comes my help? My help coming from the Lord. But the Bible says in verse number 3, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. I mean, listen, there is promise after promise that God is in control. There is promise after promise that God knows what He's doing. There is promise after promise that says, God owns my feet. He directs my feet. He controls my feet. God knows what He's doing. But when you step back and you look at somebody's life that tries to live right, tries to stand right, tries to serve right, and the Bible says that he was put down in fetters. He was shackled down. He was bound. He was constrained to what he was even though he had a heartbeat for God. He had a desire for God. He had a momentum for God. He had an ambition for God. He thought everything he could to be able to please God. But in spite of all he tried to do, the Bible says all he got was to be shackled down. Amen. Now I want to ask you this morning how many of you have ever thought that it'd be something in your life, and I don't say this, it's not necessarily a circumstance. I will dare say, like Brother Tiny, I've heard him say, well, Brother Jason's a nightmare. Somebody say, man, I'm just kidding. Sometimes your nightmare is not a situation. Sometimes your nightmare is not a problem. Sometimes your nightmare is not a temptation. Sometimes your nightmare is not a past experience. Sometimes your nightmare is not what you're facing. Well, that's going to be a nightmare. That's going to be a nightmare. Sometimes your nightmare could be a person. It could be an individual. It seems to be something that is not realistic, but you make it realistic because it seems like you're in la-la land and you're not aware of the surroundings around you because somebody and something and some situation has got such a hold on you that you just can't break free. And you wonder, God, how am I going to make it? I want to talk about this nightmare. The number one thing I'd say would be this. The travel isn't pleasant. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 18. The Bible says in verse number 18, talking about Joseph, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. The Bible says that literally that there was a travel that he had there that when it started off, when you look back at this, you realize that in chapter number 37 of the book of Genesis, the Bible says that there was a young man by the name of Joseph, and he had a dream. And as he had this dream, the Bible says that he began to pursue it, but yet he was separated by his father. He was betrayed by his friends and his family. He, he was put down into a pit, and, and he was in a place to where uh, he did not know what was going to go on. The truth be told, his dream was the fact that God told him. Not a preacher told him. Not his mama told him. Not his daddy told him. God God told him that he would stand one day in prominence, that he would be in a position where people would bow down to his feet. But can you imagine that moment when he's sitting down in the bottom of the pit, when God done told him one thing, and now instead of people bowing down to his feet, the only thing he could do is look up at the feet of the people that did him wrong. I'm talking about hurt settled down on the inside. The travel wasn't pleasant. God said, I got a plan for you. But the path you're making me take, God, it ain't a pleasant path. It ain't an easy road. 
It ain't what I thought it would be. It ain't even what I thought it could have been. Lord, this is a little more difficult than what I anticipated. And the Bible says that literally that he was in a place where his feet, notice the text, it says his feet, they hurt with fetters. They weren't just any kind of, uh, of, of instrument, if you will. It was something that was painful. It was something that was put on him that shackled him down it probably was a one size fit all. He might have had a size 13 shoe where it was put on a size 10 fetter. Y'all with me say amen. They didn't care about his pleasure. They didn't care about how good he felt. They didn't care about what he thought. They didn't care about how easy it was on him. All they cared about was shackling him down. Let me say this to you. Sometimes the nightmares in your life, they don't come in your size fits all. It's one size fits all. And literally, the problem is, is that when it comes in your life, it might affect somebody else one way, but it might affect you a completely different way. And the Bible says that when he got to this place, that they shackled him down, and now all of a sudden as he's sitting there looking up, the Bible says, notice the text right after that, that he was laid in iron, that he was laid in iron. If you break that down and you study it, when you see that book, that, that word he, it means his soul. When you look it up in the Hebrew and the Greek and you translate, it means his soul. So in other words, it's not just talking about him. Look here. It's talking about the fact when his feet begin to hurt that now he was laid in iron. So in other words, the very issues that was in his feet that now it got so deep, the physical pain began to, began to draw into a, an emotional, a spiritual, a soulful pain to while now it was changing him emotionally. It was changing him psychologically. It was changing him spiritually. It was changing him in every single way because physically he was shackled down. And if some of you have ever been in that state, you'll learn in your life that sometimes the battles we face are on the inside but the door's always opened up by what happens to us on the outside. And the Bible says that when he sat there, that those fetters set on his feet, and as those fetters set on his feet, it said that he was laid in iron. As he sat in those feet, and the Ishmaelites, they picked him up, and they began to travel with him. After he was brought out of the pit, and he was laid into them, it reminded him of what his life used to be. It reminded him that the pain that's on my feet, you might sympathize with me and you might pity me, but what you see ain't all that hurts me. What you see ain't all that's really going on with me. And what you see might be reality to you, but it's a lot deeper than you could ever imagine is what Joseph felt. And he began to think about his father when he looked at those fetters. The way his father was separated, the one that gave him a coat of many colors, his very identity now stripped of him to a place to where he did not know who he was. He did not know where he was going to be. And now every time he felt the pain in his feet, down deep in his soul, he felt the separation of the one he loved the most. It reminded him of a dream. The song sounds good when we shout, say Amen. I have held some dreams in my hand to know they just slip right through. And in his mind, when he felt the pain that everybody saw, it reminded him of a pain that nobody could see. And he said, but my God has told me that this is what God wanted me to do. But on the inside of me, because of what's on the outside, it's affected me. And he said, it's affected me to my core. To a place to where the very thing that God tells me that he wants me to do, that I'm beginning to think this is not right. I mean, how in the world, God, have you, have you, have you just walked away from me? Have you pushed me to the side? Did you lie to me? Did I misunderstand you, God? My feet's hurting, but as he travels on that wagon... In the middle of his nightmare, day after day after day, battle after battle, all people see is the fetters on his feet. But in inside of his mind and deep inside of his heart, his life is tossed back and forth. All everybody sees is the road they travel. All everybody sees is the pain that's on his feet. But he sees the dream that was promised to him by God. Come to find out that it looks like that he ain't on the right path because now either God's a liar or he got off on the wrong path. He's sitting there, and the Bible says that it's beginning to settle in with him. 
I don't know if any of you have ever been in a place, and I'll move on, to where literally things have affected you so bad that it affected you physically, it affected you mentally, it affected the way that you responded to your spouse, the way that you responded to your children, the way that you responded to God. It affected the way that you read your Bible, and it affected the way that you prayed and you believed that God heard your prayers. It affected the way that you would embrace people and the way that you would trust people. It affected the way that you would embrace what God wanted you to do. It affected the way that you lived with confidence, the way that you lived with trust, and the way that you could hold your head high and fight hell with a water pistol. It affected the way that you knew that if God be for me, then who could be against? It affected you. That's exactly the way Joseph felt. When everybody else just saw fetters, and they pitied him. Oh, they pitied him. We're sorry, Joseph, you got to live that way. Oh, we're praying for you, Joseph. We know it's hard, Joseph. We, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know. Let's be honest. There's things that you and I go through that people might think they know, but they ain't got the first clue. But I want to tell you something. If there's a way to encourage you through this, I want you to be able to look where the Bible says there that literally that is fetters, they hurt. I was telling the young people that do you know through all of the book of Genesis when you study out Joseph's life, you listen to me, not one time does Joseph ever say that he hurt. Not one time does Joseph ever speak of his pain. Not one time does Joseph ever open his mouth up and really let people know how bad the hurt really is. Not one time. The Bible says in Psalms 105, that there was a God in heaven that when nobody else could hear the pain and nobody else could see the pain and nobody else knew the pain, that there was a God that was keeping a good record and He knew exactly what He felt. He knew exactly what He was going through. What are you saying, Brother Jason, that everybody else might forget and nobody else might recognize? But I want you to know that no matter how low the valley is, no matter how wide the river gets, no matter how deep the pain may be, that God knows exactly what you're going through. The Bible says if you continue to be able to study, if you go over it for just a moment in Psalms 37, verse number 25, I'm talking about the nightmare, how he awoke from a nightmare, but the travel isn't pleasant. Notice this, if you will, as we think about this thought, that in Psalm, Genesis 37, 25, the Bible says, and they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes, and they looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Now, if you can let me, or with the help of the Holy Ghost, illuminate your mind for a minute and illustrate this. The wagon that was coming to get Joseph Joseph that was in pain. Joseph that was hurting. Joseph that was struggling. Are you hearing me this morning? The very wagon that was coming to pick up this broken, feeble, deeply wounded man. The Bible says just came from a place called Gilead. You say, why is that significant, Brother Jason? Because the Bible says that when they picked that young man up and they put him up on that wagon... In his broken spirit and his broken body and the woundedness of what he's doing, that the very, listen to me, friend, the very thing that God would use to carry him to his destination provided the grace and the healing that he needed for his current pain. See, that balm and that myrrh and that spicery from Gilead, it was something used for healing. And I want to tell you something, you might not realize it, but along this journey, there'll be something that God will put you on and you'll begin to travel. And if all you do is see your pain and not look around, you'll forget to recognize that there's somewhere in the shadows, whether it might not be uncovered, that God will always have grace that is sufficient for whatever you're going through. Always. Always. Did it take off the fetters of His feet? No. 
Did it take away the memories in his mind of the hurt and the pain that he had? No. Did it change his circumstance? Did he get off and run free? And was he set in a place of prominence of where he needed? No. But God never promised it would be easy. God just promised that he'd always give sufficient grace and he'd never leave you nor forsake you. I want to give you these principles real quick and I'll move on in a hurry. Number one, let me say this. God can use what brings pain and carries pain to bring you healing. And all God's people said. God will always provide sufficient grace. And all God's people said. Amen. And before we move to our next point, God, though others may not be, God is interested in what seems to be insignificant. Now, to make this point known, I, you have to think about the problem that matters to you that you don't want to speak up in front of nobody because it's petty to you. I mean, it's petty to everybody else, but it's big to you. It, it's, I mean, do you all realize what we're talking about? We're talking about Joseph's feet. Are you all with me? We're talking about Joseph's feet. There, there's nothing significant about Joseph's feet. There's nothing great about Joseph's feet. There are two things that God's given him for him, but it's insignificant. But here's what that teaches is though it may be insignificant to everybody else, it always matters to the Lord. When you're praying for your children and other people stop praying, when you're praying for your situations and your hurt and your pain and other people think that's insignificant, when people begin to belittle the pain and the hardship and the valleys and the struggles that you go through, oh, that's not a big deal. Look at brother so-and-so. Oh, somebody's always got it worse. Yeah, somebody's always got it worse. Well, let me say this. God don't ever speak to us that way. God don't ever speak to us that way. Every problem, every pain, every trial, every situation, every nightmare, every lack of sleep, every tear that falls from your eyes, God cares about it. The preacher might not always be there, and he's not. I can't. The deacons won't always be there. Your family won't always be there. But there is a God in heaven that will always be there anytime you need Him. The second thing is not only do you see that the travel was not pleasant, Miss Deborah, you come if you will. I want that. There will be grace. Listen to this. Number two, that the traveler must be positioned. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Because you got to remember, we're still in a nightmare. So why would God let him go through all this? you got to understand that sometimes the things that seem to be a nightmare is not really a nightmare. It seems to be a nightmare because of the perspective you have. Because, see, the very wagon that carried this young man in his pain is the very wagon that took him to his destination. And the Bible says back, and keep your thumb, if you will, in Genesis 37, but the Bible says in Psalms 105, verses 20 and 21, the king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all of his substance. The Bible says, if you go back over to Genesis chapter number 42, notice the text, verses number 45, 4 and 5, the Bible says this. It says, but Benjamin, but Benjamin, his brother Jacob, sent not his brethren the less lest peradventure mis, mis, uh, mischief but befall him. And the sons of Israel came by corn among those that came, and the famine in the land was Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. What are you saying, brother Jason? This is what I'm saying. That God sometimes will take the very thing that brings you the most hurt and the pain to use you, to take you to where you will arrive at the destination where God has called you to be. The Bible says that he was literally in a pit. You know the story. It said he was taken out of the pit. When he was taken out of the pit, that he was put, these Ishmaelites, they came by to get him. They sold him into Potiphar. You know the story with Potiphar. He was falsely accused. I mean, the pain just kept getting worse. You ever felt like it was a snowball? Life just keeps getting worse sometimes. 
Maybe not life, maybe that person, that nightmare just keeps getting worse. Now all of a sudden he begins to flee when he gets, gets away from there and then he gets back in prison and he has a butler and a baker and a, he ends up telling the baker that he ain't going to live, that he's going to die and he died. He ends up telling the butler, the butler gets out, he, he got out but he forgot, forgot Joseph. So here Joseph, man, I mean, he's done been, he's done been betrayed by his family. Listen, listen to me, I'm almost done. Been betrayed by his family. His hopes and dreams have been shattered. He's now, he's now, he almost saw the light at the end of the tunnel and it, it just seemed like at the very end that the, the light went dim. You ever got to a place in your life where it's like, I see the light at the end of the tunnel and all of a sudden the light just gets real dim. And all of a sudden, one day, old Pharaoh comes down to where, where Joseph is, and he interprets his dream. And the Bible says that before it was all over, the very place, listen to me, the very place that God told Joseph he would be is where Joseph ended up. I want you to know something today. God's not a liar. You look up here. I know I probably preach more Bible with this than I did application today, but I want you to hear me, and I'm not done. I want to give you one more thought. God's not a liar. God's not a liar. I don't care who's told you, what made you doubt, what's got you confused. God is not, never will be, never has been a liar. Never. And sometimes... If you're not careful to put on your helmet of salvation, armor of God, the devil's going to make you believe what the devil believes, and that's how the devil wins. The last thought I'd give you, and I'm done, is this. I want you to see, after he awakes, he realizes that it wasn't really a nightmare, because that's where he says in, in 50, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, and all God's people said... Listen to this, though. The last thing I'd say to you is not just that the travel is not pleasant and the traveler needs to be positioned, but lastly, I'd say this. You need to remember that the traveler, you need to remember who the traveler belongs to, the person. If you notice in verse number 17, notice the text. He sent a man before them, even Joseph. Look at me. Do you know why he got there? Because he wasn't in control of his life, God was. See, this journey that you're traveling, you're never going to end up where you need to end up until you start following the one you're supposed to follow. And sometimes when you follow, you're going to follow him through some dark valleys. And you're going to follow him through some trying moments. And you're going you're to follow him through some sleepless nights where you're up on Facebook, want somebody to pray for you. And you're going to follow him through some times where it seems like people forgot, they've turned their back, they don't understand. But you have to remember that if God calls you, God's going to lead you, and God will equip you. But the last thing you need to do is jump off the wagon. Listen to these two verses, and I'm done. The Bible says this. Notice the text. Listen to me. The Bible says in Psalms 116, verse number 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, listen to this, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I, re I really just want to encourage you today that God knows what He's doing. And you can awake from the nightmare when you realize that as long as you belong to the Lord, it ain't really a nightmare. It's just a journey that God's got you traveling. And God's teaching you. Can I get amen? amen? Psalms 40, verse number 2. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. Listen. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my goals. If you've ever been saved, you hear me, that will never change. That will never change. Your fix today ain't a change of circumstances. It's a change of perspective. And you need to realize that God knows what He's doing. 
And I hate to tell you this, but he knows what he's doing in your children's life. And he knows what he's doing in your spouse's life. And he knows what he's doing in that loved one's life. The one that you keep trying to control when you're getting frustrated, God knows what he's doing. Amen. Amen. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you are lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? I want to ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.